So today I'll be presenting on the Fernando Pico papers. Uh, this collection is specifically from his work in the area of Boyomula, as well as what is now known in Carolina. Um, he is a late Puerto Rican historian who wrote concise histories and his work is really detailed. In this particular collection that I have are his personal research notes, right? So that means that they are not in any type of accessible format to other folks. They are not primary source material. He's actually referencing a lot of primary source material like newspapers, like um, birth records. He's referencing census records all the way back from pre-emancipation to um, the early mid 1900s. So in this a thousand and some pages of information and data that he left, um, there's a lot of things that are being covered. He's referencing newspapers, he's referencing police records, he's referencing um, households, he's referencing certain events. And so um, it is something that is very broad and it can be very intimidating. But for this purposes of the talk, I'll be talking about how I use them and what I'll be doing with them. Um, so I received the papers actually from a mentor, Francisco Scarano, who was assisting me in trying to look through um, material that could be uh, kind of overlapping with my work on Bomba and how women are viewed in Bomba and have been viewed throughout history in Puerto Rico, right? So, right, looking at like the area and what it once was and what it is now, right? Because the area that this particular um, archive references is rather large. It's not just Oyomula, it's also like Carolina. It's also referencing Luisa. So there's different places that we know now that have been gentrified to be um, look, like attributed to other uh, city boundaries. But something that was interesting was while I was looking at the census records and all of the other source material, I began counting like the different plantation or hacienda names that were being referenced so far. I saw 19 that I've counted. Um, and there's a lot of evidence of migration happening to this area. So we have people from the census who are from the Canary Islands. We have people who are from Jamaica. There's also people from like St. Croix. We have people from St. Kitts. You're gonna see people from Cuba, Venezuela. There's gonna be a lot of different folks in this area, which lets us know also that like, Bomba, as a lot of people already know, is this space where people can come together from various places and really share with one another. And it becomes a space of Black genealogies and geographies that extend beyond Puerto Rico. So Bomba becomes this place that connects Puerto Rico to this Black geography of the larger Caribbean area, right? So also it's letting us know that if people are in the Bomba scene during this time, which is again, like late, well, let's go with post-emancipation, which would be like 
early 1900s to the mid 1900s, we're going to see that this is where newly migrated Black people are meeting other Black people, right? And that makes complete sense when you take into account other dance traditions like Goka, like uh, Martinique's Ballet, like the Tumba Francesa, right? Like there's all of these different dance traditions that people become familiar with growing up. And then when they move to Puerto Rico, they're seeing something similar. And that similarity is what's making them comfortable. So then they begin to use bomba as a type of kinship making practice. And so I'm really interested in that aspect of um, the information in the archive. But what also interested me was the way information was uh, presented, right? So if you look back on census records, um, I'm sure Melanie has examples of census records in, in her presentation and in her talks this weekend, but most times there's a head of household and then the other people are um, listed within the household, whether they're, they be renters or godchildren or cousins, things of that nature. But in the PICO research notes, it was really interesting to see that a lot of the names that are mentioned, right, and it's like thousands of people, are most of the time in the same format. So there'll be a man's name or sometimes, if we're lucky, a woman's name and everyone who's in the house. And so what that told me was when looking for women, a lot of the time I had to look under the men's name and see how many women are attributed. So even in these notes, right, women aren't given their own space in on a page to really examine who they are. Um, their basic information is recorded like their their age, their race, whether or not they're, they can read, uh, what they might be doing for employment, and if they're married, widowed, or single. And so a lot of the, the work that I'm invested in, again, is the way things look. And my own project, which I presented on at the last Bomba Research Conference, looks at, uh, bomberas throughout history up until the present and how people are using bomba to really understand feeling and how each rhythm has a different emotional expectation and how this type of flexibility allows for folks to live life right um how bomba makes the space for folks to continue to live life throughout various crises and also find joy, right? Um, so I'm going to get into some of the more numbered type things. So I was really invested in trying to find um, clues to life and Black life at that within a Puerto Rican archive. And so Fernando Pico's notes, which um, are really helpful for this because they contain a lot of like newspaper articles or police records that can no longer be verified, meaning that like a lot of these documents have been moved or lost. And by lost, I mean people don't know where they're at or they have been lost in fires or natural disasters. And so there's a lot of information there that cannot be referenced elsewhere, making this material very, very valuable to researchers and to a lot of other folks. And it's for that reason that I am taking my time to really work through it and present it in partnership and sponsored by Life Code. Um, Digital Humanities Against Enclosure to turn it into a uh, online uh, accessible portal for folks to use and to look up and to explore and learn from. So some of the things that I mentioned that I'll be talking more when I release the archive online as well as in some upcoming papers is that the the ways in which Black women are referenced, particularly Black enslaved women, most times are often referenced as properties. So 92 times 
um, women are referenced as property and they're mentioned by, by like, mm, named like probably 51 times. So they're often named in like these baptism or death certificates or records. And so that's 51 women. Um, and this is just like enslaved women, right? So then the other 39 times they're mentioned in a sentence structure like so-and-so owns X amount of esclavas, meaning like they might say so-and-so owns like 30 or 10 or five. And in that way, there is no naming happening to the point where this type of sentence structure appears 39 times, but really they're describing 105 women and girls, right? And so there's various racial categories that we've all come to understand how in recent studies that have been published and recent newspaper articles have been published, people are saying that Puerto Ricans are reclaiming um, being a multiracial and black country. And so we see here that the ways in which people are identifying themselves racially and being identified racially change. So you're seeing negro, you're seeing pardo, you're seeing mulata, you're seeing de color and color, which honestly happens after the 1930s, which means this is after the United States begins to take over the census work from Spain. And so you start to see the whitening of Puerto Rico in this particular way. Um, and then I'm trying to like wrap it up because I know that um, it's not a rather like long presentation, but um, so I just want to talk a little bit about how people will be seeing um, the archive and the digital edition soon um, and how I'm referencing it in my work. So me particularly, I'm trying to look at the history of feeling in Black women in Puerto Rico through Bomba and using Bomba and see how people today use this type of historical feeling to teach Bomba, but to also live their everyday lives. And so one of the folks who I was drawn to in the archive is this woman, um, Concepcion, right? And so Concepcion, she is under this Enrique um, person and she's a cocinera and she's a viuda and she's 81. And when asked, where is she from, her, her mom was, from Venezuela, but she says that she, Nacion en Mar, right? That's what she says. She responds to the person, Nacion en Mar. So instead of saying like, oh, I was born at this place and, and at this time, she's saying I was born at sea. So this means one of two things, right? She can either have been, by looking at her age and verifying with the slave registry of Puerto Rico and kind of guesstimating um, the age of enslaved folks, she could either be one or two, one of two concepcions that are listed in the registry according to her age and the ages on the on those um, on those records and that are linked, honestly, one of them, I haven't been able to verify for sure. That's why I'm very hesitant to say like, whether yes, definitely, or no, definitely, is linked to the family that she was working with as a criada. Um, so this would mean then that she lived through emancipation and then began to work um, for really low wages with the same folks who owned her, right? So then we're able to really think through what the legacy of enslavement looked like in Puerto Rico. And that also lets us know that she is, she, she does know where she was born, but she's telling this presumably white census taker, I was born at sea because she just, she's not down to, to answer that question, which also can lead us to 
maybe she isn't one of those young enslaved girls in the slave registry, but instead is still um, demonstrating refusal, right? She's refusing to ask this question and keep certain parts of her life her own, certain parts of her life um, intimate and out of the government record, which is which is also a win, right? And while it can be frustrating as people want to know um, historical data and want to know the truth, um, particularly me, I always approach things like I'm looking for something. Maybe people's histories aren't always our business, right? And so I find this act of refusal like equally perplexing, but equally magnificent. Um, so I think that there's a lot to be said about someone refusing to answer a question, but also leaving us a, a puzzle, a mystery to figure out and to see what all the different possibilities could be. I remember in my last presentation for um, y'all like two years ago, right? I was talking about how folks don't really know for sure what occurred. And using Sadia Hartman's critical fabulation, we can we can generate a type of possibility, a possible life, possible circumstances based on historical fact and things that we can verify, things that might not have been erased by fire or hurricane or earthquake or floods. And we can generate a type of possibility that is equally rigorous in historical work. And so I see that happening here. But something else that I found was um, it verifies a lot of the things that Melanie has presented about, particularly um, last year we were at Domingo Negron's Bate. And a lot of folks in this particular archive continuously asked um, they continuously asked police folks, police, um, for their, like, um, they asked for permits to host dances. And if they weren't given permits, then sometimes I found that they were fined for hosting dances, right? So here we're seeing like people asking for for permits and we start to see that Bomba was really policed heavily. Um, aside from it being le illegal at one point, except on particular days, these strict codes are being put in place to really keep an eye on the way black people are living. And through these census records and police records and the personal research notes that Pico has, we're starting to see the ways that Black people, especially Black women, are being um, tracked. They're being preserved in, mem in, in memory in a certain way, right? And that's why the memory that Bomba generates is so important as well. Like, sure, these papers are great, and they can generate a lot of good work from, from other scholars beside myself once they're online, but also what's important to realize is the memory and the and the history making that people are doing within the bate and within the classes of bomba right and that intimate relationship of oral history and bomba because that is what ultimately gives bomba this type of emotional longevity throughout history to survive so a lot of the folks that are gonna be discussed and talked about um, in other parts of this presentation were also present in this census. And sometimes there were stories of um, particular police like happenings with them. Sometimes um, you can see how they shift their lives change with each census. So I'm really excited about this particular um, session. And I'm really sad that I could not make it there in person. But as always, I'm sending everyone my love and I will 
hopefully see you all at the next WOMA Research Conference. Thank you all and thanks to Melanie for having me.